loving and gracious God, who teaches the ministers of your church to seek not to be served, but to serve. Send your spirit upon us as we respond to the challenges of our time and as we foster conversations that engage and enlighten. Grant that we may be effective in action, gentle in ministry, and constant in prayer. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. If there is one word that we should never tire of repeating, it is this, dialogue. We are called to promote a culture of dialogue by every possible means, and thus to rebuild the fabric of society. The culture of dialogue entails a true apprenticeship and a discipline that enables us to view others as valid dialogue partners, to respect the foreigner, the immigrant, and people from different cultures as worthy of being listened to. Today, we urgently need to engage all the members of society in building a culture which privileges dialogue as a form of encounter and in creating a means for building consensus and agreement while seeking the goal of a just, responsive, and inclusive society. Church's social teaching is not based only on simple humanism, but on a deep Christological motif. God has so identified with our humanity that each of us, as human beings, has been lifted to a dignity beyond compare. Thus, whatever disfigures or damages a human being is an insult to God's own self. In a more poetic way, Karl Rahner has envisioned that because of the word of God in our midst, it can now be seen that each of us is a little word of God. The one word of God uttered in our midst reveals to us our own beauty because we are each a little word and together we will spell out something great. the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It is no longer good for anything 
but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so, your light must shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. Together we pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace, where uncivil words prevail. Show me how to model love. Help me to remember the God-given dignity of all and invite others to do the same. Show me how to build bridges and not walls and see first what unites us rather than how we diverge. Let me seek to understand before asking to be understood. Give me a listening heart filled with empathy and compassion. May I be clear in sharing my own position and respectful and civil in describing those of others. Let me never tolerate hateful ideas. May I invite all to charity and love. Lord, help me to imitate your compassion and mercy. Make me an instrument of peace. Amen. Welcome. It's nice to see a room full of people at this uh, great event, which is our last on-campus event of the, of the semester. And I'm so delighted uh, that Megan and Cara have so successfully uh, taken the torch from uh, the wonderful forebears of our continuing ed uh, program. And we're in very good hands there. One of the things I love about continuing ed is a, is a way of keeping my dear friend and mentor, Dan Harrington, alive. So take that uh, Advent course, because Dan's words are as... Uh, 
relevant now as ever. And then just a little caveat, then I will introduce the speaker. Um, because of my inability to buy locate, as much as I like being here and, and seeing so many friends here, I'm going to dine and it's going to look bad, but I'm going to dash right after this introduction because I have to be across campus for another meeting. It has nothing to do with uh, my unworthiness before Teresa or the fact that <laughs> I'm unhappy with it. No, I wish I could be here. It is a great delight to me to introduce one of our own faculty this morning, Dr. Teresa O'Keefe, who's been teaching here at Boston College since 2005. I think she started in high school, and she teaches in the area of adolescent and adult, uh, young adult faith. As a practical theologian, she has been assisting ministerial and educational leaders from diverse settings to read their contexts and analyze their impact on constituencies. Drawing from multiple disciplines, especially sociology and developmental psychology, she tries to unpack the complexity of culture and to think theologically about ministerial settings. By doing so, she hopes to help educational and ministerial leaders do their work more effectively. Dr. O'Keefe is a native of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and prior to her doctoral studies, she served the Roman Catholic Diocese of Springfield in the Office of Religious Education for 10 years. She has published multiple articles and book chapters over the past few years. A particular note is a 2014 article, Growing Up Alone, The New Normal of Isolation in Adolescence, which is found in the Journal of Youth Ministry. Another publication I'd point or highlight is The Adolescent and the Transforming Spirit, which is found in the edited collection uh, from uh, STM faculty called The Holy Spirit, Setting the World on Fire, which was published by Paulus Press a couple of years ago. More recently, in December of 2018, she had an article published in the Christian Educational Journal called Colliding Ecosystems, Interpreting the Complex Social World of Adolescent Children of Immigrants. Finally, and I'd be remiss not to uh, mention her book, Navigating Toward Adulthood, A Theology of Ministry with Adolescence, which was published last year by Paulist, won an, an award from the Catholic Press Association in the area of catechetics. The work Professor O'Keefe presents today in today's workshop draws from her dissertation research. For that work, she examined how the conversation in the setting of a known divide, in the case of her dissertation, uh, Catholic-Jewish dialogue, how that uh, conversation in a known divide contributed to the learning among the adult participants. She has given more attention to this topic in recent years as the political and social uh, cultures have made such dialogue both more necessary and difficult. We have a very timely presentation today, and I ask that you please join me in welcoming Dr. Teresa O'Keefe, who will be speaking to us on Building Bridges, a conversation in a time of division. It's good to be here with you this morning and looking around the room and seeing lots of familiar faces, which makes it kind of fun and a little less threatening, you know, it's not a, not a room full of strangers. So let's just move right into things because we have a lot to discuss today. So I start by inviting you to imagine or to recall a discussion on a difficult but important topic. Imagine or recall. And it's around which you know or you expect disagreement. With an individual, since you're a group of ministers and educators, I'm crafting it this way, with an individual you're either directing or a group that you're leading, some sort of relationship such as that. So imagine that. Put yourself in that space. Now imagine going completely off the rails. <laughs> All right. Now the next question. What emotions arise for you? Hold that thought for a moment. What emotions arrive? Do a little accounting, an inner accounting assessment. All right, 
I'm going to do this simply by a show of hands. For how many people was it anxiety? Okay, that's a good, right? Discomfort, at least? No? Disorientation? Anger? Ooh, there we go. <laughs> Fear? All right. How about guilt? Yeah, a couple hands for that one. And for who was it exciting? <laughs> a couple, all right. And for whom was it a source of joy? I will note, let the record show, no hands were raised. Okay. One of the interesting things I did find in my dissertation work was that many consider the recipe for things like that, talking across a known divide with somebody else, to be, they, they presume ahead of time that's going to be uncomfortable. They presume ahead of time that it will be a, a, a source of harm that will be rancorous, that will be insulting, that there will be de debate in a nasty kind of way. And as a result, people self-select to not engage. Right? So that's a very important thing to pay attention to, is people presume for the worst and therefore avoid. Right? Now, the emotions are not unimportant. In fact, the emotions are very important because they, they point to deeper realities about life. They, they, they suggest differences of experience. Uh, they potentially challenge our values, or we, or we read them as such, that when we see something in another that's different from ourselves, we, we then make value judgments about who they are and what they hold dear as being different from, your, from ourselves. Right? It can be a challenge to our theological perspectives, which can be unsettling. Right? Uh, it can be a different political outlook. Okay, it, it can be, and this is very important today, the fear of winner take all, that the stakes are too high to be wrong. Again, this is a very important, I think, sense today in our current climate, okay. It can be a fear of loss, very often is, or of anger over some sense of injustice. These are important indicators to tell us something about what's deeper, what's going on. So not unimportant, in fact, very important. But another piece I also want to underline here is that the, the encounter with the other can feel like a threat to one's self-worth, right? Particularly one's moral virtue. And you have to notice the cultural world in which these, these realities become more pointed uh, and important for us. However, as ministers and educators, which I know good many of you are, we have to deal with these. We have to either lead groups of people in conversation productively, whether it's about simple things like the finance committee of a parish, you know, or, or what have you, that you've got to engage with people who are going to have different points of view. And the, the cultural climate causes those different points of view to get exacerbated. You may have to facilitate groups in this. You have to talk to, about difficult topics with people that you, that you know or you presume are not in agreement on things, right? So it's not something that you can, you can easily avoid, working with folks whose views are different from one's own. Right. So let's pause for a moment, I ask you to pause for a moment and think, as you came here today, what topics do you find or anticipate as difficult or problematic in the communities which you serve? You all came here for a reason. It's not just because I'm so wonderful as a speaker. <laughs> but you all came driven by something, some concern. So what emotions do you associate with those and why? And what do you hope to learn today for your own work? So focus yourself. Take a thought for yourself. And I'm going to just take a quick survey here about our GAs with their mics at the ready. 
No, they're not. <laughs> quickly, quickly. Thank you. All right, I just want like uh, maybe one or two people to say what what issue or concern uh, and what emotion do you attach with that issue or concern? Anyone? Anyone? We're afraid. We're afraid. John. I would like to know how to communicate with the millennials and uh, whatever, Generation Z, the young people and in our midst. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that there's a chasm between us, or seems to be. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking for ways to, really what I want to do is bring them back to the church. Mm -hmm. Okay, and do you have an emotion that's attached to that for yourself? Apprehension, okay. anxiety. Okay. Um, yeah, that's about. All right. Thank you, John. Another. Uh, um, my name is Joe Cabanas. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I'm a veteran for peace. And I think the most difficult <clears throat> topic to talk about is war and peace. Mm -hmm. We've been at war for 19th year in Afghanistan, and nobody talks about it. And so what emotion does that raise in you? Pardon me? What emotion does that raise? Oh, that, uh, emotion br uh, brings a lot of anger in my, my life because I was in Vietnam and there were people out there protesting the war. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank and you. And I find that this, this uh, church, the church says nothing about it. We spent $5.7 trillion on a war that I fought in, in the last century that was the same war that is going on today, and the church says nothing about it, you start talking about it, and people ignore you, and there's just no, uh, and Christ is supposed to be the Prince of Peace. Thank you. Thank you. So, anger is often an indicator of injustice, and it can be a very useful emotion. Uh, it can be one that turns people off, but it also can be one when channeled in, in effective ways can promote action on the, on the part of the issue where the injustice is happening. So let's see how we might think about that. And one last one. I'm a local uh, parish pastor, also a Western Jesuit grad. Uh, and the political landscape and the upcoming election, um, I, I can't even zero in on the topic. Um, but I feel I'm still learning my community and there's residual anxiety about people having left because they felt that it wasn't a safe place for them to be anymore as more conservative. Um, I know I'm not alone in this. Um, and so I feel just frozen <laughs> with all of the above. All right. Thank you. Thinking of how, to, how we're going to walk through the next year together. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank, there's more here. I know it. I know that's why you came. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, we are in a time of division. No question. No question. This is just images from the last few, few weeks, couple of years, really important things that are ongoing. You cannot listen to the news today without it being one story after another of some division going on. And most of them, many of them, move to violence or you fear at the edge of violence, right? So what do you do with that? It's a reality that says we've got to work some way through this, because especially if you have a sense of it's getting worse. And I'd suggest in other parts of the world it's already worse. But we may worry for ourselves here saying, well, when will that kind of um, violence show up on the doorsteps here in Chestnut Hill, or wherever it is you are. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things to pay attention to, and I think for me, for me, this is really, really important. Division sells. Division sells. There are very strong interests that wish us to be divided. And we're constantly surrounded with cultural messages about division. So I have up here images from blockbuster movies or series that everybody loves, 
their great production value, but a common storyline of us against them, and it'll only be resolved momentarily by battle. Right? It's an ancient myth of, of redemption through violence. It's an ancient myth of redemption through violence. And it's one that we're hearing more and more and more and more and more today. And I want you to just pay attention to that. What are the interests behind a, a proliferation of cultural messages that make extraordinary violence acceptable? All right. The reason I raise it isn't because this is a talk about that, but it's, it's exactly why the work that you're trying to do is more difficult. There's a lot of cultural forces that push us to polar extremes. All right. I'd suggest to you that a lot of the attraction of movies like this is that they, they, they play on very good human qualities. One is care for those who are close to you. Allegiance to those in your ambit. Okay. The destruction of evil. Right. So those are all natural human goods. Of course, we never have a, a, any kind of sense of what the rationale behind the evil is. We have no sense of anything. It's just there to produce more evil. Okay? And so humans have a desire to care for those who are close to them, care for those who are known to them, right? and fight off those who are a threat. Okay? That's natural. It's good. You know? it's like, but I think that's the way humans are made. So when we say people are being more divisive and pushed into polarities, it's, I'd suggest to you perhaps many people start in those polar places, but those polarities become exacerbated. Right? It actually takes work to get people beyond polarities. Rather than saying we resort to them, I'd suggest in some ways we start there. Okay, so what do we do? What we're trying to do, or I'm trying to do, working out of a very different cultural narrative that says peace is not found through winning the next war. Peace is found in gracious giving of oneself to another. And it's a very different cultural message. The, the culture, because in the US we consider ourselves a Christian country, in fact, this message is, is rather lost, right? but it can be at the center of what it is we're trying to do. We're looking to a further horizon. We're looking to put ourselves on the ground, or, the, or here's my image here of ocean, we put ourselves out there on the horizon of God's love, which then in, causes us to engage in the world in a very different kind of way. All right, so let's see where we're gonna go. I always like to give people a warning about what lies ahead. All right, check one, we've already done emotions. Okay, moving right along. The next thing we're going to look at is our theological foundations. I'm going to then go into what do I mean by conversation. Uh, then uh, talking about agendas and settings, like the context of, of conversation. Then we're going to go into some more practical pieces about how do you set the stage and move forward with a group, because I presume that many of you are actually responsible also for working with groups of people. Okay. Uh, somewhere in there, there'll be a break, so don't worry about that. Okay. <clears throat> Um, another name that came up for this talk was Saving Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thank Kara for that one. We'll see. We'll see. No promises. Okay. So what I want to do next is, is look at our theological foundations, right? Why? Because the theological guides us. This is not about being nice. You will be nice, I hope, but it's really about something more profound than niceness because the reality is niceness will get pushed aside at some point. People will do things to one another that are not nice, not intentionally, perhaps, but yes, yeah, sometimes intentionally. But so it has to be grounded in something else. We need a deeper purpose for continuing on what's going to be difficult terrain, okay? And we need a theological hope that guides our engagement. We have to have a reason behind it for when things get difficult, we want to say, now why do I keep going? Right. 
So one of the things that we use today was something that's a guide for me. In the prayer service, we use this quote from Elizabeth Johnson's book, Consider Jesus. We prayed over it. The church's social teaching is not based only on simple humanism, but on a deep Christological motif. God has so identified with our humanity that each of us as human beings has been lifted to a dignity beyond compare. Thus, whatever disfigures or damages a human being is an insult to God's own self. In a more poetic way, Karl Rahner has envisioned that because of the word of God in our midst, it can now be seen that each of us is a little word of God. The one word of God uttered in our midst reveals to us our own beauty because we are each a little word and together we will spell out something great. So for me, that's part of my theological foundation is my understanding of the other human person as revelatory somehow of God's presence, God's love, God's revelation to me. So it's incumbent on me to kind of discover it. All right. So I'm going to ask you now, yourselves, to uh, think about this. What's your theological rationale for respectful engagement with those different from yourself, such that you can hold your own position to have some value, not simply put it aside in deference to the other, but hold, hold some sense of what you know to be true and right. Become aware of and put aside your own biases in order to listen to the other. What's your own theological foundation for that? I'm going to ask you to reflect quietly for yourself, and then when we've given yourselves enough time at your tables, share, share something with the person next to you. Okay. Well, sounds like people had something to say to one another. It's good. By the end of a day like this, I'm tired of my own voice, so I'm actually glad to have, give you a chance to talk. So, uh, again, let's. Um, there's another question I've added here for you to think about. Is there anything said here at your table in your conversation that you found surprising or helpful or insightful? All right, and again, we'll take a couple of responses from the floor. Wait for the mic. There you go. I'll get frightened or something. It was interesting that we were in exactly the same place on the same topic, but had difficulty expressing it to each other. Uh -huh. uh, you know, rather than being uh, defining it as uh, reducing anger or disarming. How do we convert that into creating a peaceful place mm -hmm. of uh, commonality and that we leave with each other on better and good terms mm -hmm. rather than arguing? Thank you. Yeah. And I just want to note that the challenge of speaking what you hold dear. Why is conversation difficult? Just because it is. Let's start with that. And then you add to it a cultural atmosphere that pushes us into polarities. And you add to that the amount of time it takes to have a good conversation and the stresses on our time. Just factors, just factors that are, have nothing to do with the people at the center of it. OK, another comment? Thank you. I think it was it was helpful for me to be reminded of the importance of having a theological rationale for engaging in dialogue and conversation because because of the reasons you've just brought up that conversation is hard um, coming together around things where we differ and where there's polarity is always hard and that theological rationale, without that, I go at it as a fight, being right or wrong. Mm -hmm. I want to be right at all costs. And if I don't remember and, and position myself theologically and have that more profound grounding for why I'm having this conversation, I can easily get lost in those kinds of um, difficulties and distractions and really destructiveness rather than pulling myself back and remembering 
what's the deeper place that I'm that I'm coming at this from? Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well said. Let's move forward then. Yeah. So what do I, what do I mean by conversation? We're using the words conversation, dialogue, um, kind of interchangeably at moments. But uh, I want to point to a theorist that I have found very valuable on this, uh, a professor at, at the uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champlain, Nicholas Burbles, whose work, Dialogue and Teaching, one of his older pieces, uh, is really helpful to me in paying attention to the diverse forms of speech. So he's, an, he's a professor of education, and he's interested in how do we use dialogue and teaching. And the first thing he does is indicate uh, that in a postmodern world where there is so much difference, a lot of people will say, and you have heard it, we can't talk. We're just too different. We can't possibly bridge these chasms, whatever the chasms may be, whether the chasms, political views, theological perspectives, age, um, wealth, race, ethnicity, all of those things are there. But he says, you have to pay attention to all of those things because they definitely change the landscape on which people are able to engage with one another in conversation or dialogue. But it doesn't make it impossible. It doesn't predetermine the outcomes. In fact, he says, people are talking all the time who are different. Since no two people are alike, even the fact that two people can converse with each other uh, who are related to each other is indicative that, uh, uh, that the, the difference itself is not the divider, okay? But these differences that we hold, whether it's gender, race, politics, history, ethnicity, socioeconomic, and I've even added, for our setting, ecclesial status, um, can all make a difference in the, the stance of the players um, as interlocutors. All right. One of the interesting things he does is he talks about distinctions in the intent of dialogue, and one of them is an intent about the content. So he uses this framework, so this is like the content part of the morning, ladies and gentlemen. He uses this framework to say, what's the nature of dialogue? And he says there's two kinds, of, he suggests there's two kinds of stances towards the content or the ideas or the voices. And one of the stances is inclusive, he says. It's granting what he calls provisional probability to the other's perspective. Or another way of thinking about it is, it's believing first. I'm gonna believe this person's words as credible, helpful, intelligent, well-meaning, so on and so forth, okay? The other form is critical, which means that he's saying this is concerned with judging accurately. It's, so it's objective accuracy of the other's perspective. Here you're looking for clarity. And so he says the stance is more suspicious at first. Not necessarily suspicious in a malicious sort of way, but suspicious like, I, I need to understand what you're saying there. Could you repeat that? Could you say that more clearly? What are you getting at? All right. So inclusive, taking it all in, or critical, being more suspicious. The other way of thinking about is the intent of the outcome. What is the dialogue for? So he, again, makes two forms here. One is convergent, the other is divergent. So by convergent, he means it's, you're looking to get to some outcome together, some consensus, right? And in that, he calls it teleological. We need to get somewhere. So for organizing an event like this, eventually we have to come up with a plan for how we're going to do it, okay? That's teleological. You're towards a particular goal. On the other hand, we can also have a, a divergent outcome or, or dialogue that's divergent, meaning you don't have a particular goal in mind. You might be just looking for better understanding on something. Right? So he calls this non-teleological. There's no particular goal, except it might be a more general goal of understanding the other better. Right? But it's not designed towards agreement, whereas convergent is designed towards some agreement on something. Divergent is not looking for agreement. So at your tables today, we're kind of looking for divergent. You don't need to agree with each other on what you come away with this day from. You've just 
come away with something, I hope. So it's a general uh, goal, but not a particular goal. Right. So what does this matter? He then indicates four different kinds of speech that he's going to speak of as dialogue. The first is inquiry. Now, inquiry is, is suggestive for problem solving. How do we plan an event like this, for example? Or how do we create a policy for health care? Or how do we go to the moon? These are, these are problem solving processes. Okay? So inquiry is intended to investigate an issue, make sense of it. And in some ways, you, what you want is everybody's voice at the table until the best idea comes forward. Okay? So it's inclusive. Everybody's opinion is going to may be helpful here. Let's find out. Let's gather it all together. But, event, but eventually you have to come to an idea, a conclusion, and so it becomes convergent, inclusive and convergent. Right? Hoping to bring lots of voices together, but towards a particular end. And he calls this, he, he characterizes this as both believing, let's hear everything, and teleological towards a goal. Right. Another form that he says is debate. This is dedicated to showing contrast between positions. Right? It, it is both critical and divergent. Right? So it's intended to show clarity on an issue, a concern, an idea, but is not intended towards agreement. And he says this is characterized as both suspicious and non-teleological. We don't have to get to an end here, don't have to get to a particular goal. We just want to get our ideas out there and clarify. All right. A third one is what we're doing right now, instruction. Okay. Similar critical elements of debate, it's usually one directional. So I'm talking to you. It's intended to moving you to take on a skill or information. Right. It is both critical, there's clarity, hopefully, and convergent. I hope at the end you understand these four concepts. Okay? So it's helping the learner come to grasp an idea, grasp a skill, an understanding of something together. So it is both suspicious and teleological. There will not be a quiz later, but you get the idea, right? So instruction. The fourth one. This one, I think, is the one least used in common parlance, is conversation. This is dedicated to mutual understanding. Right? It is inclusive, meaning you're looking for all the information to come in, all the stories, just for better understanding, because you don't know what's going to be important. But it remains divergent. We're not looking for agreement. We're not looking for you to be like me. Right? So it's non-teleological. Right. Believing, non-teleological. This form, I think, is the, one of the most valuable and the hardest to do. Right. Because as you can even appreciate from this image, a lot of it's done in more informal settings. Two friends, we expect, sitting on a park bench, sharing a story. The value of conversation is that it increases understanding of the other. It can increase my clarity about myself. As I hear your questions to me, I realize, oh, I hadn't thought of that question before. Or as I heard, hear your story, it makes me think, wow, that was an experience I've never had. Uh, hmm, that shapes, I realize now that a different experience shapes my understanding. It allows for those differences to be contextualized. You know, where did this come from? What's your history? Why is this important to you? Um, do you know anybody close to you that this is a concern for? And in all of that, it does challenge the validity of my own stance, simply because hearing more of the other story may make me rethink where I am, may me rethink my presuppositions, Make me, make me recognize that I even have presuppositions. Okay. So in a sense, it can be kind of risky. Right. But
But one of the wonderful things about it is it allows for thinking in the moment. A good conversation is a live event. We all have people in our lives who you hear them and they're telling the same story over and over and over and over again to multiple people, right? And I'd suggest that's never them having a conversation. In fact, that's a little bit more of instruction, right? A conversation, if it's a real conversation, is, is, is dependent on the interlocutor to change the story, right? So my indication of someone who, who has been heard is that their story changes. If the story remains the same over and over again, it indicates to me they've never, been, they've never felt like they've been heard. Because if they've been heard, the dynamic of the story would somehow get interrupted and the story would change. Right. So conversation then also allows for new options to arise. Right. In the engagement with the other, we hear different things, we think different things. The questions that others offer us about our own story, cause us to think answers that we hadn't thought before. So, so Burbles names these four forms of dialogue, and I'd say they're all essential for working on difficult issues. <clears throat> we need to do inquiry. We need to figure out how to problem solve. So policy making is a lot of inquiry. How are we going to come to something? And then clarity on options requires debate. Is this a better option than that a better option? Right. Sometimes we need to bring in an expert on the subject. We need some instruction. Would this work? Tell us more. We need some background. Right. But one of the pieces that's often missing is basic conversation. How is this going to impact the lives of people? Let's go find out what they think. Right. So sometimes communities do that with focus groups and that sort of thing. Um, but more often than not, people feel like they haven't been heard, that they didn't get a chance at the table, whatever that table may be. Right. So if the conversation hasn't been done that brings forward new understandings of people's real lived experience, then the other pieces fail to work. They fail to work well. They fail to work for, the for whomever got excluded from the discussion. All right. Again, let's pause for a moment and think, just think for yourselves, what do you find helpful in identifying those distinctions? I'm presuming something, right? What, what do you find helpful in identifying the distinctions among these different, four different dialogue forms? And what possibilities do they create in your imagination? So we paid attention to the emotions that arise in us in conversation, especially around difficult things. We've paid some attention to our theological grounding, or why would we bother even doing this sort of thing? We've, we've thought a little bit about the different forms of speech and how different forms get lost, uh, potentially. Right. So what I want to move to now is talking about settings and agendas. Nicholas Burbles writes, the conditions under which speech encounters take place foster or inhibit the development of the communicative virtues. We'll talk a little bit about what those virtues are. But the conditions under which speech encounters take place foster or inhibit. And he says in an another place, a sensitivity to context and the effects of speech help us to judge prudently when and how communicative virtues are appropriate. So the important thing here is choose your time and your place well. We have different forms of speech to be mindful of. Which ones get used? When do we use them? Okay. And I'd suggest, as we were saying just over here, we tend to, as Megan was saying, we tend to shift to debate too quickly. And I might ask, why is that the case? Right. For most of our public speech forms now, I mean, we're long past the time of, for most communities, of town meetings and that sort of thing. Um, but most of our public speech forms comes through the media. So trusted news sources have told us over the years. But even the ones I'm putting up here now, these are all your kind of Sunday morning talking head shows, right? You recognize them? Okay. 
And these are often, they often look like a conversation. Everyone's sitting around a table or they're sitting in comfortable chairs. So it has the look of a conversation, but it's not a conversation. There's people have talking points that they're coming in with and you never see them say, wow, thank you for that insight. You've really made me think differently about what I came in to talk about. You never ever hear that, right? Okay. You realize that they've come in to clarify positions, to say them over and over again, the same thing in slightly different words. Okay. But over the years, even what we consider as trusted sources of balanced perspectives have increasingly become less balanced and understood not as trusted sources of information, which would be important in our instruction phase of conversation, right, or dialogue. Instead, our sources are are clearly more biased than they had ever been historically. And there's reasons behind that. Okay? Okay. What that does is that it pushes people to the polarities. It pushes people to the polarities. I want to go back to the earlier slide where I said conflict sells. Many of our news organizations actually have very few journalists collecting, investigating news. Increasingly, our news organizations have personalities sitting at desks talking about opinion pieces. Right? So the greater investment, if it's not deep investment at all, is in those particular personalities. So pay attention to these things. Fewer and fewer dollars in our country are going towards actually discovering news. There are fewer local newspapers across the country. There are news organizations that do exist, have made, had to make cuts over time. Because collecting news, collecting information, is a very expensive project. But for the last few decades, it's been proposed as a for-profit industry, and increasingly an entertainment industry. Right? That their intent is to bring eyes to their screens so as to bring your eyes to advertisers' messaging. Right? So unfortunately, our news organizations, or what we've known as our news organizations, are increasingly less news organizations. And that's, that's a tremendous tragedy. Right? Because First of all, it does a disservice to us, and secondly, it means that we're, we're pushed in a narrative that many of them put that put us increasingly at polarities. Okay. Thinking in terms of Burble's framework, increasingly public speech is at best framed as debate, at best, and it's not a very good debate because there's never equal players present. Right. Right. It's suspicious critical and non-teleological, but it's frequently mean-spirited and ad hominem, meaning it's attacking the person. Right? Just pay attention to that. The sources that you watch on either side of the spectrum, the tendency to do that. Right? And in some ways, it's their own uh, dog chasing its tail. If one's doing it, the other does it to get uh, viewers, listeners, advertisers. But you think about it, and public speech is intended, I should hope, to be in service to the public. And in such should be more in the nature of inquiry or instruction. But inquiry, certainly believing and teleological. How do we solve the problems of our times? Let's all work at this and see where we go. But we're depending on sources that, to, to do this work for us, and those sources have, in many instances, given up that agenda altogether. And it's important for us to pay attention to that, and to train our diets accordingly. Contexts also have changed. So I gave you broadcast media, but now we have new media sources, right, where anybody can put up anything. Right? So, we're assaulted by, we choose in some ways to be assaulted by them, but we're assaulted by things like our mail, which I get way too much, and so do you, right? I expect. 
uh, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, Instagram, all sorts of social media platforms become the space where people are spending their time and making connections with one another. And I've, as I've argued in other places, like in a book that's at the back of the room for sale, uh, <laughs> that these places can be tremendous resources for connecting with other people, but they're terrible places for developing relationships with other people. Right? And that distinction needs to be understood in order for them to be most useful. Right? But in the meantime, they can be pretty dangerous. Sherry Turkle, who's been doing a lot of research over her career on people's use of technology, her two more recent books, one, Alone Together, Why We Expect More from Technology and Less from Each Other, she put out in 2011. And then more recently, Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talk in a Digital Age. Sherry, in 2016, Sherry Turkle talks in one about how the digital space has changed the way we talk with each other, or more importantly, how we avoid talking with each other face to face and prefer mediated technologies to do that work for us. Right. All right. In Reclaiming Conversation, she makes the argument that conversation is a learned skill, and if you're not doing it, you don't learn it. Right. I'd agree with her on that wholeheartedly. And we have to actually think more constructively about how do we reclaim conversational spaces. Two um, excellent books. But another one, Angela Gorell, a, a young scholar, her recent publication just this year, Always On, um, Practicing Faith in a New Media Landscape. She talks about how the media itself shapes what we see and what we hear and how we engage. Taking particularly of applications and how they ask you for certain things and don't ask you for others. Right? And how their algorithms work so that you hear more of the same like you. Right? And that's a decision that they make. Right. She writes, new media is often designed to get your attention and hold your attention. When the ultimate aim is making money and there is little regard for what it takes to do so, new media developers not only spread malformed convictions, values, and practices, but also create new media that contribute additionally to malformed convictions, values, and practices to humans' vision of the good life. We know these things, we hear these things, even when you have Zuckerberg um, in front of a Senate committee and he's asking, can, can we expand Facebook to do even more? And they're asked why. And bottom line is always, well, because I want to make more money. <laughs> and when asked what kinds of safeguards, he's like, oh, I can't handle that. That's beyond our control. That's just fiction. Fiction. But if their, their interest is making more money, then they're going to design, and they do, the technology to do exactly what it is that they want to do. So it's important for us to also pay attention to the, the, the media settings shape how we engage, and they shape the content of the, our dialogical spaces. They limit it in very particular kinds of ways. And those ways are to ends that are not beneficial to the users. All right. So. Let's think for a moment about yourselves. And this isn't to demonize those things. It's just to say they can be useful tools. We have to be very savvy about how we use them because they're not, as they stand, not made for our benefit. Right? Okay. Okay, so I ask you here. Recall, when you recall an impossible conversation of the past, again, here's a memory game. When you recall an impossible conversation in the past, what do you recall about the setting? As you look back, what were your expectations for yourself in that conversation? And what were your expectations of the other? Alternately, so as to not leave you in that glum place, when you recall a good conversation, 
What do you remember about that setting? Again, I'm going to ask just for a couple of voices for a brief response to either one of those, any one of those questions. What you recall about the setting or what you recall about your expectations for yourself or for the other, especially if it was something that surprised you as you th thought about it. Uh, so I was just thinking about the second question about the expectations. Um, uh, the conversation that I had was with uh, a fellow uh, classmate, but um, thinking about what I expected for myself and sort of also thinking about the other, but uh, sort of the expectation I set for myself was trying to, I think, listen. But in reality, I think I was just trying to prove a point to them or to, I think, in a way to, to try to listen to understand, but really have them understand myself rather than really truly listen to what they were saying. Thank you, yeah, good recognition. I think many of us are doing that most of the time. Yeah. I say that, I, I say that myself, I have to actually, when I'm in conversation, people say to myself, Teresa, pay attention to what they're actually saying. <laughs> don't just look, don't just look like you're paying attention. <laughs> actually, pay attention. How many times a day do I say that to myself? Well, probably not often <laughs> enough, but anyway. Someone else? Yep. Right over here. Something that came to mind to me was when I was visiting a husband of a friend who had had a serious accident. And their daughter, um, I felt sort of ambushed by a question that she raised about something in the church. I was a director of religious education at the time, and she and I just felt so unprepared and like it was inappropriate. Here I am visiting her father, but she just wanted to nail me with, with a question about the church and she was questioning and had doubts. And, and when I think of a good conversation, it's when you make time to be with the person, you have time, you're not distracted with other things, but just that, that feeling of being ambushed and maybe I didn't handle it the best way I could have if we had made you know, a set time to talk. So that was just something that came to my mind. Excellent, yeah. And that's, that often happens, especially people who do church work, um, could be in the grocery store by the yogurt, suddenly you're answering some question. For me, well, the first time that happened, I was, home from break in college, visiting a high school friend and her grandmother was there and she asked, what were you studying? And I said, religious studies. And suddenly I had to answer for the Inquisition. <laughs> My friend still apologizes for that and I'm so sorry. But th that's the thing is that we get put in places um, that we feel unprepared. So we'll talk a bit about what do we do in that instance. Okay, any other? Thoughts? One more over here. So maybe uh, listening to these um, resp or these sharings, um, it, it calls, to, it, it tells me, as you say, the setting. So um, often when these, some, some uh, meetings happen, it's always from like a one-sided person, mm -hmm. you know, or, or whatever, and you're in their space, right? You're not in a, a neutral space. And so, obviously, the dynamics of that encounter could be altered by being in a different space. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yes. And, and uh, in a good conversation, I think about meeting with um, a friend, um, just rela you know, just a uh, for a conversation, and um, openness, and you know, like going to a bridge or being in a park or, or something like you know, it, it like just lends to that that open dialogue, you know, as opposed to feeling like you're on somebody else's turf yeah. and you have to fight for your ground yeah. while that, you know, whatever. You know what I'm trying to say? Yes, I do. The context yeah. matters. So you're indicating neutral spaces, the value of a neutral space. That's not always an option, but sometimes you're the host. Sometimes you're the guest that can change the dynamic. Sometimes you may be living in the same household. <laughs> like, well, where do you go then? Okay. <laughs> but yeah, the, but space isn't just a physical thing. It is a physical thing, but it's not just a physical thing. Time is another element. Um, 
Yeah. There's one more person who's got her hand up. She's eager to say something. Yeah, so this is with somebody I live with and have for 35 years. <laughs> there are no names. <laughs> no names. Um, but I, as we get in, and I'm probing and wanting to love better and understand, and sometimes he's just... He just can't go there. And I finally realized just how much pain sometimes is attached to what I'm trying to get at. You know, even a decision about traveling somewhere, and I realized there's trauma attached to that place. And then I think also um, a lack of vocabulary sometimes uh, really, I'm really realizing comes into to play in these kind of conversations. He, you know, but he, he thanks to 12 years of marriage counseling, um, we've, we're making good progress, but I'm, I'm learning to be patient, whereas before it was, why can't you just tell me this, yeah. you know? And sometimes at the end of the conversation, it, it, it'll come. If, at, at, there's fruit sometimes yeah. at the end of this. He realizes it. It surprises him, so... Yeah, thanks. I like how you say that it surprises him because, again, live conversation should eventually be surprising to us. That It's non-teleological. We don't know where it's going to end up. Okay, So these are important things to pay attention to. Another thing that she's raised here is the need to be able to articulate. And the things that are deepest in our heart can be what drives us the most, but it's also the very hardest thing to talk about. So what kind of prompting, what kind of care, what kind of time is needed in order for people to say the thing that is most important? How do you assist them or how do you allow them the space and the time? So when I say what expectations for yourself and what expectations of the other, sometimes our expectations of the other, we don't realize it, are very high. Right? And one of, the, one of the really central expectations is that we have an expectation that the other will come to see things as we do. Right? Feel things as we feel without you ever telling them what's important to you and why. Right? Now, I think that's a natural human emotion that we presume that people see the world as we see it, and we're quite surprised that they see it otherwise. And that's why conversation is so essential, so valuable, so important to the process. And it takes the time and care that it needs to take. All right, so we are at... 11.30. We've been at this for a little while. Let's take a, a break. I'm going to say 10, and I know you're going to take 15. So let's say 10, and you'll... <laughs> okay. So let's take a break, and we'll come back and do some more. Not bad. That was 12 minutes. Good for you. Good for you. All right. So much to do. Now that we've figured out the problem, what do you do for a solution? <clears throat> There's a lot of different skills about conversation that can be used, and um, happily, there are more and more resources and organizations that are um, putting out materials, guides, helpful resources. So I don't feel I need to say all that needs to be said, and I couldn't possibly say all that needs to be said on this topic. Um, but I want to think about just some, some important elements of setting what I'm calling setting the stage for conversation. And I hope in this part that you take away both some themes and then maybe some practical ideas. All right. So it's in multiple steps. Step one, conversation, as is understood here, is so much work, it should be something that matters to you. <clears throat> Hans-George Gadamer, a German a philosopher of the 20th century, wrote, when he talks about conversation, it says, something is placed in the center, which the partners in dialogue both share, and concerning which they can exchange ideas with one another. Right. So it's not about any frivolous topic that we bother having a conversation. Right. It's about more important things um, that you engage with. 
But sometimes it takes some conversation to come to some sense that, oh, actually we hold this thing in common as important. We just think of it very, very, very differently. And that may be the case, especially in congregational life, where you've got diverse communities of people in front of you or in schools. Yeah. So you're saying, all right, there, we have shared interest, the fate of the world. Maybe we ought to talk about this. <laughs> right. Now, however, the first thing that I would say about these issues and that whether, how they matter is I'm going to suggest that you uh, uh, avoid the binary. Beware. Things are presented to us in black and white. And it's normal for humans to think in more black and white terms. Concretes are easier for us, and we always cling to them as helpful and resources. In fact, I'm giving you concrete instructions by giving you a step one, a step two. The concretes are valuable. But the problem is, is that when we work in binaries, we stay there, they become unproductive. So while initially attractive, like our friend Pepe Le Pew, Eventually, they stink, right? <laughs> Why? Because, first of all, binaries limit the imagination. They give us only two choices. It's either this or it's that. Yeah. Are you for illegal immigration or are you for whatever? You know, so there, notice, and I want you to notice that the dialogue is set up culturally, and I'd suggest by sources that have reason to do this for their own self-interest, to push us to binary choices. So we have important issues to discuss, but the binary choices that are out there limit the way we think about it, and it boxes us into what ultimately are unworkable options. Do you want health care for all or health care for all who want it? Well, first of all, it'll never be one or the other. The issue is far too complex, and a lot of people have to agree on it for it to get anywhere. So in some ways, it doesn't matter particularly what a, 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 a political candidate says in the moment of a campaign. It's not like they get their say. Right? But in our imagination, we get limited in our thinking because of that constant choice. It's either this or it's that. So I'm saying to you, beware. Beware the binary choices. Be aware of them and be cautious. All right. The further point is that binary choices also encourage demonization because the, pol the polar opposites then push us to think that we're on the right side and that whoever else is on the wrong side. And this becomes, this becomes extraordinarily divisive. This is why we have violence. Because the opposite becomes demonized in our imagination and therefore we have all rights and privileges to do away with the demon. So it's very important for us to say, wait a minute, am I, I'm being pulled into that. I'm being pulled into that. It's really attractive. Boy, I want to fight. I'm up for a fight. And you have to say to yourself, wait a minute. <laughs> it's ultimately unproductive. Ultimately unproductive. The challenge in a divisive society, particularly the ones that we're living in, in not only the United States, but more increasingly globally, is that it becomes an issue, the way the polarization is done is almost everything becomes an issue of moral import. And I would say to you that a lot of the issues are of moral import. The state of the, the economies, the state of trade, the state of immigration, the state of uh, the, the environment, just about every issue that we're talking about is in fact an issue of moral import. But the polarity in them puts the moral import in the wrong direction. It puts the moral import on fighting one another and demonizing one another and not on solving any issues. But going towards that natural human tendency of wishing to preserve oneself, wishing to preserve one's, those who are close to me. Who th and very often, especially in a, in a new media landscape, 
those people who think like I do. And the reality is those people who I presume think like I do, that we're alike and the others are different, right? Underneath all of this fear of dialogue with the other is a fear of truth and authority. Humans, by their nature, attend to truth by asking for valid authorities in their lives, whether it's church, whether it's government, whether it's what, okay? And so part of our d challenge here is to recognize that, the, that we too are challenged in that. That our own fear around an issue, our own anxiety around an issue, may be because we are going to be upset in what it is we think is right. So from a theological perspective, I frequently say to myself, and I often say out loud, God is somehow even bigger than all of this. If God is God, then God is bigger. If I believe in a God who created all things, visible and invisible, even this fight does not get us outside of God's care. So... With that in mind, can I enter into this conversation with somebody in a way that says maybe together we'll discover something more true, more deep, that we will not, in our efforts, exhaust the truth and neither of us have, just because of our being human, have, have a unique, or not necessarily, not a unique, but we see all of the truth whole. That's simply impossible. Okay. So what I'm going to recommend here are things that help us unpack the complexity. Binary choices, by their nature, erase complexity. They push us to polar opposites. Are you with us or against us? Are you one of them or one of us? Are you doing this or doing that? Are you, are you red or are you blue? Okay. So what you want to do is actually unpack the, the complexity, but not in a way that accuses the other person of being simplistic. <laughs> Your problem is you're only seeing this in a binary way. Now, what I'm going to do for you is save you from that. No, that's, let's suggest that's, that's the wrong foot to start off on. But you want to you ask questions. If you're really going to talk about this topic, you want to ask questions that open it up immediately beyond the binary, behind the this and the that, okay? So you're going to ask questions that invite people to break it open somehow with their own story. Uh, for example, it might be asking them literally about their own story. So this issue seems really important to you, immigration. Tell me how it affects you personally. Where do you encounter this in your day-to-day -day life? If they say, well, it, you know, it doesn't. It affects the state of the nation. Yes, but can you think of how it actually impacts your functioning and, and the, those things that benefit you? you know? So sometimes what that does is it allows you to find ways that the topic that they're talking about is not really the topic that concerns them. Right? But we live in a world that says, let's lump everything into barrels. And so this might be, just connecting with the original story of the person may give you, may, I'm not giving any promises here, there are no promises, <clears throat> it may give you a different way in, but you want to break down that complexity or to ask them, so this is an important issue for you, how do you see it and how did you come to that understanding? Another piece of this is we often talk about the actions that people are going to take. They're going to vote for this or they're going to vote for that. They're going to talk about this or they're going to talk about that. And those practices of talking or voting or, or genuflecting before communion or whatever the heck it is, those actions that people take, our actions are always loaded with meaning. But our mistake is to presume that we know the meaning that the person intends because we're reading that action from our perspective. And we know what it intends for us, but we don't know what it intends for the other, I will argue. Okay? So you want to ask about what's behind it. Why do you, and presume for the good. 
why do you, why do you do that? There must be something in that that you find helpful. There must be in that that you find important. Why is that important to you? Tell me more about that. Now you're going to move people eventually, very often, since people are not accustomed to having conversations, you actually have to prompt a lot and say, tell me more about that. And they'll, you'll get stories. And you have to really listen. <laughs> Don't be listening like, all right, I'm going to get my point in. But you really have to listen. <laughs> you have to listen and, and attend to that story. And I'll tell you, this takes a lot of practice to do this well. So I've put up some suggestions there. You know, what's the value that inspires you around this issue? So you feel, you really feel strongly about it. Why do you care? And you can't say, why do you care? Like, what's that all about? You have to actually say it in a way that invites people's honest response. You know, because you are, you may not be aware of it, but you are asking people to take a risk, to trust you with something that they have to say. Okay. And I'd suggest that you sympathize with what you can. It's like, you know what, that actually, that's an important value. I really appreciate that value. But that's not one that I would have thought of relative to this issue. Um, or you might say, that is an important value. Tell me more about why that particular value is important to you. Again, you'll get more. What you want is the complexity. You want to hear the story because that's going to send you somewhere different and the, your interlocutor. You're going to go in different directions. But when you sympathize with what is held in common, it increases the capacity for trust. Right. Now, don't be disingenuous, but I would say sometimes it's a stretch to say, well, yeah, I can see that. But if it's not something you hold dear, you don't have to say to them, I think that's stupid. <laughs> telling you, these things are unhelpful, but these are the things people say. And then they wonder why no one will talk to them intelligently. Okay. Let's, all right. So you want to be on the lookout for complexity in their story so that you break the issue open further. And eventually, you're going to find somewhere you can actually go. But if you just start with the polarities that are given by sources outside ourselves, that locks you into two unworkable choices. Step number two. We haven't gotten very far, have we? OK. <clears throat> Become an honest broker. This honest broker is a term, uh, years ago, I was, so I was so happy to hear this addressed to me. It was my godson, my nephew, who said to me, we would meet for lunch every once in a while, just have lunch. He's the oldest grandchild in our family, and he was my godson. And we would just, the two of us, go out and have a chat about this or that. And he's always fascinated with the news and what's going on. And, <clears throat> and he said to me years ago, he said, you're an honest broker. By that, I understood him to mean, that I would take time to listen to both sides of an issue or multiple sides of an issue. I wasn't quick to judge. Uh, you could tell me something and I wasn't going to hold it against you, that sort of stuff. You know? So I recommend that you actually become an honest broker. But your intention, there's a caveat here, your intention to be one doesn't mean you are one. Right? Because being an honest broker is somebody else's assessment of you. Just because I think I'm trustworthy doesn't mean, in fact, somebody finds me trustworthy. So you actually have to actively work at being trustworthy. Many of you know this because I look around and I say many trustworthy people here that I know. Okay? Because for your interlocutor, their perception of you functions as reality. And this is a mistake that we too often make. What I intend for myself is what you should understand and is as, as you should receive it. Like, no. Now, can you imagine being boxed into that, that you actually have to take life on somebody else's intentions? It's not possible. Now, once you learn their intentions, you might say, oh, I can see that. But what, in fact, you did was step all over me. Holy smokes. Please don't do that again. I will have a hard time not reacting the same way. Okay, so we have to learn how to both be givers and we have to be more attentive constantly to how other people receive what it is we give and not assume that what I gave for one person is going to work equally well for what I do for another. All right. Hans George Gadamer, the philosopher I mentioned a few moments ago, <clears throat> he argued in his book Truth and Method, first of all, the, 
just this understanding of the title, he, he says that there isn't a method for discovering truth. There's not a recipe to follow. It's a discovery, a discovery found in process. But what he said in this book is that humans always start from misunderstanding. We are, as humans are born meaning makers. We do it all the time. We're making sense out of everything. You're trying to make sense out of the slide. You're trying to make sense out of, you know, whatever, what I'm saying. We're constantly making meaning, right? And our learning anything new is based on what it is we ever, whatever it is we knew before from utero onwards, okay? So humans always start from misunderstanding to understanding. And we're never done. He says it's human to prejudge, not because we're bad people or immoral or thoughtless, but because we haven't learned yet. We always come into any encounter with presumptions about life, and we're constantly having those upset. Sometimes it's dramatic and sometimes it's minor. You realize, oh, the paper towel dispenser's on this side of the room, not that side of the room. You know, whatever. It can be as mundane as that or more profound. But we're constantly moving from misunderstanding to understanding. And if we fight that, saying I should already know everything, we undermine our ability to engage constructively with anyone. Right? So understanding is, it requires openness to a dialogical process, he argues. And the kind of openness he talks about is not simply open-mindedness, by which he might suggest that in open-mindedness, as he's understanding it, is that we have ideas in our head already, and I'm going to fit you into the brackets I've already got. Right? What he's saying is openness to difference, meaning as I engage with you, and you've, you've, I hope at this point in your life have all experienced this for yourself one time, I engage with you, I meet somebody for the first time, I really get to know their story, and I begin to realize, wow, there is so much more behind that person that remains mystery. That's the kind of openness he's talking about, that the other remains ultimately mystery to us, just as we remain ultimately mystery to ourselves. That kind of openness. So the ability, as he writes, the openness to the other involves recognizing that I myself must accept some things that are against me, even though no one forces me to do so. But it's a stance that you take this. I'm going to hear a story. I'm going to learn from this person. I'm going to engage with this person. And in parts of that's what I learn are going to be hard for me to take in, but I'm going to do it. Nicholas Burbles, in the um, book I referenced before, uh, Dialogue and Teaching, he talks about the need to develop what he calls communicative virtues. Right? This is not an exhaustive list. This is just a list. They include such qualities as tolerance, patience, openness to give and receive criticism, the inclination to admit that one may be mistaken. The desire to reinterpret or translate one's own concerns in a way that make them comprehensible to others. The self-imposition of restraint in order that the other may have a turn to speak. And, often neglected as a key element in dialogue, the willingness and ability to listen thoroughly and attentively. How many of us are good at that, at that all the time? No one, but the records show, no hands were raised. Yeah, exactly. It's hard. It's hard. And, in, and I like how he even says that last one is often neglected as a key element in dialogue, listening thoroughly and attentively. We talk about it all the time, but in fact, we do it very little. We listen, but we're not. We're listening and having thoughts of our own. We're listening, oh, and getting distracted. We're listening, we're looking at our phone, whatever. It's like, no, to listen is a moment-to-moment -moment activity. I and mean, so you have to cue yourself in on a very regular basis if you're doing it. So I'm recommending that we be mindful of our own reactions as we're listening. What emotions come up in me and why those? What am I afraid of? 
very often I'd kind of say, kind of key emotions are either fear or anxiety um, or anger. And you may say, why? What's that about in me? Now, to do that in the moment takes practice. Eventually people can get there. Sometimes you just say, I just got to go away. <laughs> but paying attention to one's own emotions, one's own language, one's own behavior in the moment. Another is to pay attention to your impact. Noticing how what you're saying is being received. Changes in body language, change in the atmosphere, changes in facial expressions, changes in somebody storms out the door, you might say, that didn't go well. <laughs> or maybe they had a bus to catch, whatever. Right? Maybe it's not about me. <clears throat> Remember, intention is, does not equal impact. What we intend may, in fact, not be what happens. So being able to say, wait a minute, I noticed that you, were, you flinched when I said that. I'm sorry if I, did I say something disturbing? I don't even know if I said something disturbing. Did I say something disturbing? Right? And then not to say, well, my intention was that you should feel good about what I said. It's simply to say, I'm sorry. I didn't, that wasn't my intention. Let me, tell me how I cannot do that again. Tell me how I could do otherwise. <clears throat> word of advice practice 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 and you're still going to screw up you know <laughs> I've had some I've had occasions where people say well you're supposed to be an expert on dialogue and conversation how come you're so bad at it right now because <laughs> <laughs> I get to be a jerk too now and again all right it, we, get, we get better at it the more we do it, and when we're being a jerk, we're more aware. <laughs> Hopefully, you're like, yes, okay, let me pull it back. All right, so I encourage you, even if you become expert, there are moments you're going to screw up royally. Okay. Step three, choose a time and a place. Going back to the uh, quote from Nicholas Burbles, the conditions under which speech encounters take place foster or inhibit the development of communicative virtues. So you may have all of these great skills in another moment, and then you get into this setting, and they fall away. And there's reasons for that. There's history, there's political, there's time, there's whatever. So a sensitivity to context and the effects of speech helps us to judge prudently when and how communicative virtues are appropriate. Thanksgiving, maybe, maybe not Thanksgiving. I don't know your family's dynamics. You know them better than I do, right? If it's the only time of year your people who are close to you have an intelligent conversation, well, take advantage of that, right? But if it's, you don't have a history of having intelligent conversation here, or it's rancorous or full of emotion and stress, I recommend that you keep away from dangerous topics, right? Choose your time and your place. Pay attention to atmosphere. Pay attention to your own um, emotional state. Uh, it was raised earlier. Pay attention if you're ready. But you may also pay attention to whether the other person is ready. Okay. And here's a bit of advice. You don't have to rise to every occasion. Just because somebody puts the bait out in front of you doesn't mean you have to bite it. And this is important. This is important not only for yourself, but it's important for the other person. One of the things I learned years ago was I really don't like debate for the sake of debate as a form of entertainment. I used to have a neighbor um, who then married into the family, and so he was around regularly, and you have... He would... No surprise, he went to study law because he was a great litigator. He loved arguing. He loved arguing on stuff. And I finally learned to say to him, you enjoy this, don't you? And he's like, yeah, I do. And it's like, this topic is too important to me to, to play around. If you're serious about it, we can talk about it. And more often than not, that kind of response to somebody... It, is actually either caused them to back off, like, oh, no, 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 I was just, like, trying to make, I was just trying to make small talk. 
try something else. <laughs> <No? clears throat> or they'll say, no, actually, I'm sorry. I I, this is a topic that's really important to me. Well, then let's, let's, let's find another time and place to talk about it, because it is important. It's an important topic. But let's find the time and the place. So learn for yourself how not to take the bait. Learn for yourself when you are being forced into a, a debate style, which is, was mentioned already a couple of times I've heard it, that it's a, it's a style we naturally fall into or get set up into. You're going to have to notice that for yourself and learn, how do I turn this into something different? How do I not take the bait as offered? Right? So what you want to do, as I was just suggesting, is assess mutual interest on the agenda. It has to matter for both of you if you're actually going to engage in it productively. Is this something you're concerned about? Yeah. Why? And if they're saying, no, I'm just trying to get you angry, well, if, con congratulations. <laughs> Pass the potatoes. You know, whatever. It's, it has to matter to both people to make it worth your while. So you have to be wise within yourself to notice, is this good for me? Is this good for another? And if the other person is serious, then you want to follow up at a time that is more appropriate. Well, let's talk about this, if that time isn't. Right? Let's talk about this sometime. Let, when are you free? When can we do this? This is really interesting. Maybe we should go to a lecture together on this topic and be, see what it inspires in us for our you know, mutual engagement. So again, both of these bring us back to step one and step two. It has to matter. Um, and you want to be an honest broker in that. You want to be someone who's a reliable interlocutor. Right? that has thoughts of your own, but is respectful and open and listening to the other. Okay, Okay. so let's take a, a couple of moments for you to think for yourselves. Um, what are some one-on-one -on -one settings and situations that would benefit from better conversation? And what strategies or tactics do you have for those settings? What would you advise? All right, so I ask you to think for a moment for yourself, then I have you turn to your immediate friends again, and we'll just take a couple of moments to share. This won't, uh, too many people have a chance to share a thought, but the person who thinks they've got something valuable, you can share it with the others. So what strategies or tactics do you have for those settings? What would you advise? Now I'm going to focus on working with the groups, because many of you are in settings where you actually have to, you're responsible for groups of people talking. And in this, again, beware of the binary choices. And think about that as you're setting things up. You're going to have people coming into whatever setting you're creating, expecting binary choices. So if you think about that, that people start with either black and white, then you've got to say, don't be surprised that they're there. You say, well, no, let's, I've got to actually help people see beyond the black and white. Now, you won't tell them that because that will be off-putting and they'll not come back and they'll not engage. They'll say, she thinks we're stupid. Like, no, you don't, you, I'm, not, I'm not saying that at all. It's just very natural for us to have focused on concretes in front of us. It's a, the first thing humans do. Um, so don't berate people for that. But just as you're planning, say, it's likely that people will be starting in one place or another. There'll be slight variations, but in, in general, what you're going to find around you is a lot of binary thinking. All right. And appreciate simultaneously, as you're thinking about the others, that the others are really other from you. They're not you. And you have to find, you have to do some real serious work to figure out, who am I working with? And what do they know? And how do I engage them productively? Also know that they're coming in with a presumption probably that if we're going to talk difficult stuff that it is going to be hard and they're going to avoid it. Right. And one of the crazy things is that we think we know about the other just because we do. Because we, we always enter the world with some pre-understanding. So we think we know about the other, but what we know about them is always skewed. And similarly, what they know about us is always skewed. It's never fully on board. Right. So when they say things and we say things, they're going to sound a little off base. They're going to sound a little kooky. And, and I recommend that you enter with presuming for the good. 
Here's a, a, a small excerpt from the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. When he's instructing directors, he's saying, it should be presumed that every Christian ought to be more eager to put a good interpretation on a neighbor's statement than to condemn it. Further, if one cannot interpret it favorably, one should ask how the other means it. So don't presume, especially if you've had something upsetting. You say to yourself, I, I'm going to presume that they didn't mean to be ups upsetting to me. Let me find out what's behind it. Right? So, and you live in a world, humans are shaped by the cultural worlds that they're in. They use the language that's available to them from that cultural world. Of course they're going to speak in ways that in one group makes sense of and the other group gets offended by. It's natural. It's normal. So we cannot presume that we're above that. We all use language that can be upsetting to other people, not because we intend it, but just because that is the reality of being humans in the world. Right? So how do we then put uh, our best presumption on the other? Well, let us presume for the good, but then inquire when we need to know more. But another important thing that we have to pay attention to is that life is not an even playing field. When we're talking about issues of race or gender or ecclesial status or socioeconomic or ethnicity, there's almost always in an, any kind of engagement one person who holds more something than the other. Right? And to engage in conversation across that is risky on both sides, right? For the person who is um, on, usually perceived as like on the bottom side of the scale, the downhill side of the field or whatever, um, who are constantly fighting uphill, their vulnerability might be in thinking, if I share this with you, you're just one more of these people who's gonna misunderstand and use what I have against me. So it takes a while to break down that, and it takes actually the relationship to break it down. Right? You have to appreciate the power dynamic. You can't simply say, listen, we're all equals here. We're all equals. Let's all sing Kumbaya. You can't do that and have it work, because what you intend for it to be is not necessarily what people receive. Okay? So you have to say to yourself, how can I make this more? open? How can I make this more trustworthy? How can I make this more safe? You cannot proclaim a place safe. This is a safe space. You should all be able to say your deepest, darkest thoughts. No, you have to create it in their presence, and that takes time. That's why really important stuff takes a long time to get to, because in the meantime, you're building up the relationship, you're building up the trustworthiness of the interlocutors, and say, okay, this I will tell you. Right? <clears throat> and you have to pay attention. If you're going to do this well, what is it going to cost for people to involve themselves? And how do I prepare for that cost? Or how do I help them get over those hurdles that are there? All right. <clears throat> you have to create space for mistakes and recovery. I think that's essential as Christians. There's a really interesting um, chapter. I've been reading this book, White Fragility, by Robin D'Angelo why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. And what she discovered is that most of the people she spoke to and what she's talking to are white progressives who invite her in to talk about how do we become a more diversified space. And then she eventually will have, at some point, have to say to them, that thing you just did was racist. And they'll say, no, it wasn't. And she's like, she's like they can't, many of the people she's dealing with cannot see the difference between their intention and its impact. And she said they spent all of their time arguing how their intention should be how the other receives it. It's fascinating, fascinating. And what's really fascinating is it happens not just in issues of race, but all sorts of issues. You have to accept this as I meant it, not as you received it. All right, think about that for yourself. If you're on the receiving end of that, you know, like, wait a minute, that's not quite right, and it isn't quite right. So we have to be very mindful that our intention is very different than our impact. 
And we may, in fact, ask somebody about their intention. We might say, I expect that you intended that to be quite supportive and thoughtful. I'm like, oh, yes, 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 I did. And did you find it so? I'm like, no. <laughs> oh, but I, I appreciate your intention. Now, if you're the facilitator of this, you want to say, I appreciate your intention. The reality is the way it landed was very different than you intended. So next time, let's think about how you might do that differently. Now, the person might be so overwhelmed that they, their intention should be what happened that they can't even entertain that, which is a lot of what D'Angelo encounters with people. But I think really central to, for me, for creating a space of, of, of set around Christian values is the understanding that people have to be able to, to recover from mistakes. Reconciliation is a centerpiece of the Christian tradition. We, so it doesn't mean that they, I have to make them say they're sorry. That's not what it means. It means I have to make it possible for them to say they're sorry. I have to find a way for them to recover from their injury, just as I have to, from, from creating the injury, just as I have to attend to the person who has been injured. Otherwise, neither will be able to move forward in a productive way. So, recommendations. Be aware of creating a relational space when you're creating spaces for others. Build time and processes to get to know one another. When I was doing the uh, interfaith work, we insisted on having a break because we knew that not all the important conversation was going to happen formally. The people had a different kind of chat over the coffee pot, and I needed that space to be there for people. Okay? So build time and processes to get to know one another. Create ground rules for engagement. I know a lot of people do this. You might have the group do that. You might prompt some things, but offer others to join in and add to it. Right? And then you might remind them of them later in the process. Those things are found, people find them to be helpful. Then start easy. Don't start with the hardest stuff first, which some people are very eager to get stuff done. Like, well, let's get to the meat of the issue. No, work your way towards it, because this is all part of developing that relational space. Where we're going to learn how to trust each other. We're going to learn how to listen to each other. And it's not that listening to each other is hard because I have to take time to stop and listen, but listening to each other requires I've got to figure out how this person speaks so I understand what they're saying. All right. In the interest of time, I'm just going to keep moving through some of these. My fifth step is facilitation. Now, you might imagine yourself in this process, but facilitation, I find, is really valuable for difficult conversations with people. And I, I, I consider the facilitator both as a map reader and as a, as a traffic cop. The, these are two images that came to my mind years ago. The map reader means that they have a sense of, okay, I know where we're going. I know the bigger objective of this discussion. And a good map reader can tell the difference between a dead end and a shortcut. So you may be going off the main route, but you're like, this one's going to be productive. I, actually, this is good. This is good. I'm glad this person raised this question. We're going to be moving over here. And other times you realize, oh, nope, that one's a dead end. That's, a, that's just trying to get us off topic. Okay? So a facilitator is, takes on the responsibility for the group of keeping track of that. Now, it doesn't mean that they're solely responsible. In time, a group develops, develops its own ethic, but it, it usually develops a good one when it's well facilitated. The other is a traffic cop. The traffic cop knows when the flow should happen. You know? Sometimes, in some settings, it, it doesn't mean that everybody speaks evenly. In fact, almost in no setting is that the case. There may be a time when you want a vo everybody's voice to be heard, but there may be other times for the production of the topic that only a couple of voices speak, because a couple of the voices might take the whole group to somewhere new and valuable. And so, just as a traffic cop knows that this road needs to clear out more because it's getting way, way, way backed up and there's productive things happening, and this little side street, I don't need to stop this traffic every two seconds just so this traffic can go. Okay? So the traffic cop knowing to modulate engagement among the members. In all of this, you're creating a relational space. So that when you get to difficult stuff, you'll keep going. Potentially. Burbles writes, a successful dialogue involves a willingness, a willing partnership and cooperation in the face of likely disagreements, 
confusions, failures, and misunderstandings. Persistence in this process requires a relation of mutual respect, trust, and concern. And part of the dialogical interchange often must relate to the establishment and maintenance of those bonds. So you want to say to yourself as you're organizing a group, how do I grow in this group? Respect, trust, and concern. You don't notice, you don't have to like them. You don't have to agree with them. But you can grow respect, respect trust, and concern without those things. The facilitator also serves as a model. The facilitator models, hopefully, listening well, thinking out loud. That's a risky thing. People don't like to be seen thinking out loud because it indicates that they don't know something already. So if the facilitator's thinking out loud, and they might even just say, well, I'm thinking out loud here. And people are like, oh, how startling is that? <laughs> OK, appropriate risk taking, thinking out loud being one of them. Respectful disagreement. Crafting questions that open up the conversation. And the multiple conversational virtues. So the facilitator who is ready for this is going to say, all right, I, my job is to create a space here. And I'm modeling it as I go. They also invite questions, and we've talked about many of these already, questions at the level of experience, personal experience, clarifying questions that get underneath externals and coded language, you know, the bi gets away from the binaries, questions that reveal values and hopes, questions that unveil history and perspective. If you're a good facilitator, you know that there's a lot of work that goes into crafting good questions that, that open up conversation and thought rather than close it. All right. Think for yourself. What group settings might you be creating for conversational space? And what strategies or tactics do you have for shaping those settings? I've named a number. In the interest of um, time, I'm not going to pause for a conversation around this, but you can stay later, any of you who are able and willing. Um, so let's move forward. Step six, and this is my last step, reconciliation. You have to allow people the chance to recover from mistakes. Maybe not in that moment, but in time. Right? And because we live in such a divisive world, you may have to you have to be very conscientious about doing that. You have to facilitate that if necessary. You have to allow people to leave, but then you may have to allow them or invite them to come back. No. It's the only way. I think it's the only way forward. No. Final words of advice for you. Be brave but be humble. Those two together are necessary. Right. Thank you. <laughs>